the seat. All set? Call this special uh, board meeting of the Board of Education for order at uh, 631. Folks, if we could please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Fire evacuation announcement in case the alarm should sound and we have to evacuate this chamber. There are two exits. One to my left, your right. Go out those doors, take an immediate left to go straight out to the parking lot. Or right behind me to my right, go straight out those doors to the parking lot. Kathy, roll call please. Mr. Janitis. Mrs. LeBlanc. Here. Mr. Feely. Mr. Grady. Here. Mrs. Suzak. Here. Mr. Serrard. Here. Ms. Hall? Here. Mrs. Rancourt? Chairman Neville? Here. Uh, items 5, student presentations. Uh, Dr. Schumann, could you uh, introduce our presenters, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd love to. Uh, this evening, we have two presentations on information that uh, board members have asked about, uh, very special programs going on in the district. district. Uh, one is the Talented and Gifted program right here at uh, at JFK Middle School, and the other is part of the IPAC consortium, which is happening in all the buildings across town, but tonight we have some representatives from the high school. So we have Mr. Brian Zawadniak, uh, who is our talented and gifted teacher with some of his students, who will uh, give us a presentation first, and following that we have Mr. McAvney uh, from Winfield High School, and he's going to be presenting some things on the IPAC. Very good. Mr. Z? Just in the interest of uh, getting this all on tape here, if you're going to speak, if you could pull the mic right over to you just so that we can uh, uh, hear you, let the audience hear you, and also have it on the, uh, the videotape. So basically, we're just going to tell you about the program and what we've been doing. Grab the mic, Mr. Okay. Z. You just said that. <laughs> basically, my school, oh, that's where you left. Basically, my students will just be telling you what we've been doing in our TAG program. We are on Facebook. So I figured instead of giving you a presentation, you could just like us on Facebook. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Who would like to go first? Julia. Um, we've been, we have been, uh, we achieved our goal of recycling in the cafeteria and we made, and we uh, were the, one who made that happen for the first time, recycling in the cafeteria. And we put up posters around the school um, reminding students what and uh, what not to recycle. Um, well, we recycle a lot, um, and we have bins that are usually out here. We recycle milk cartons and other recyclable materials. Well, I sort of prepared a little speech for my caller. Well, I'm Zachary Healy and I'm from the sixth grade Talents and Gifted program. Um, I came to talk a little bit about it. Um, we recently implemented recycling and the cafeteria as my two friends here talked about and we're trying to get a grant for a greenhouse plus we are almost acquiring solar panels to help decrease our electric bill and we are doing future problem solving which is a series of the identifying problems and then we have to find the main big problem the solutions finding the best solutions of the other solutions and grading those and then finally developing an action plan to carry out our solutions and we've been doing history day too which is like a big presentation and my group is doing the industrial revolution in america and the other is doing steve jobs and lastly we will be doing invention convention in the future and our own model type three projects which we each choose a subject and 
we have to get lots of evidence and details about that. So, and we here in the TAG program have a great teacher too, Mr. Zawadniak. And he's helpful, funny, and great to all of us. Thank you for your time. Very good. You can just move the mic from one to the other if you want. It'd be just as easy, I think. Um, we've been working on future problem solving and how to make that better our responses. And also History Day. And my group has been working on the jet engines. And yeah. Just move the just move the mic right down to it. <laughs> In, his, uh, in TAG, we've been working on ways to go greener at JFK. Um, we've been working on our future problem solving to um, get our scores higher and try to qualify. And we've also been um, working on the Energy Expo PowerPoint pre presentations that we're working on um, to present here. We're going to be doing invention convention, hopefully. And um, for History Day, we're doing the jet engines. Yeah. We're very nervous. <coughs> they did a great job. Thank you, guys. You're dismissed. Thank you very much. Can, can we, uh, would, would like to ask uh, any questions? Oh, sorry. Yeah, any, any questions? Go ahead, Tina. So when you guys are, are doing um, recycling and your future problem solving, did you guys decide as a group that you wanted to um, pursue things in recycling? Or <coughs> is that something? Well, um, we sort of had a set goal. Like last year, I guess, we had there's people that were doing anti-bullying so Mr. Z and us all set up a goal like the sixth graders did recycling and we wanted to pursue that and also we wanted to beautify our campus with trees because you know it's we want to make it more inviting so yeah excellent I think that was a good choice Joyce I understand you're being part of the energy expo can you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing there? <laughs> um, at the Energy Expo, we're going to be going around to solar panel companies and seeing if they would like to give us <coughs> solar panels. We also want them to like see if they would um, like to benefit us with any energy, like saving to help alter with alternative energy. Mrs. Susan, you said you're on Facebook. Yeah, I can share. Something to say about that. You can like us on our Facebook page at. Um, right, tell me what you. Tell me what you're. What am I going to search on to find you? Oh. Um, what are you going to search? <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried a couple of searches here. And I didn't find you. So. Uh, it's uh, JFK Middle School. Okay. Talented and gifted program. Okay. Enfield CT. Okay. Thank you. Thank we you. will like you now. <laughs> Just as a uh, question, you, somebody mentioned, I don't remember which one of you, uh, going for a grant for a greenhouse. Where are you headed with that? What, what's, I have an idea, uh, some of the ideas you could go with, but what, what's your plan? Um, we're planning to have the greenhouse over a little bit past Green Wing. How are we going to? Oh, how are we going to get Lula? We're going we're gonna, to um, search the internet for funds and see if anybody can um, supply us with money so we can put the greenhouse outside somewhere in the sunlight. And we're also, if we get that greenhouse, we're hoping to donate <coughs> most of our profits, if you will, of food to the Enfield Food Shelf to help out. Very good. That's what I was getting at. That's fantastic. Sounds like a good idea. 
Any other questions from the board? Thank you very much. We hope to have you come back again and fill us in on, uh, on your uh, progress. Okay. Yes, next we're going to um, learn about iPads in the classroom, and my understanding is we're going to get a demonstration of some things, including Apple TV, and Mr. Gaffney has brought some students with him, so Mr. Gaffney, the, uh, the floor is yours. Good evening, folks. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Thanks. I'm just going to quickly start off by uh, discussing a little bit about what we've done so far in the classroom with the iPads when we first got them, and then the students will do some demonstrations. <coughs> All right, so um, the technology that we have currently in the classroom, we have 28 iPads in a cart for student use. There's one teacher iPad, Apple TV, as well as specific apps and programs that we use. And we just worked recently with uh, the IT department to get the network set up to allow Apple TV to communicate devices. Um, some of the programs that we use regularly are Edu Creations, that is a digital whiteboard and video lesson program. There's eClicker, which is a polling program for students. There's Math Studio, which is a full graphing calculator on the iPad. There's Ten Marks, which is an online homework and homework help program. And Quick Graph, which is another graphing calculator, but it deals with three-dimensional graphs. Uh, first one we're going to talk about is Educreations, and Zach will take over. With Educreations, we're allowed to use a digital whiteboard, such as this, which, say Mr. Gaffney asks us a question in class, we could all take out our iPads, do the workout, and then raise them to show them to him. Um, we also, uh, Mr. Gaffney records different lessons online that we're allowed to watch at home. Oh. This is an example of one of, of, one of them. <coughs> method, other simple factoring ways don't work. It's a way to find... Edu Creations helps us um, use the idea of a flipped classroom where students take notes at home and then are able to ask the teacher for help the next day on the homework so he's available to uh, answer any questions that you had from the previous note section. Clicker is an app that allows Mr. Gaffney to make up questions and then send them to everyone in the class through an app called eAudience. And with that, we can all answer the question. And there's four choices normally. We can pick which one we think is right. And he gets instant feedback on his iPad of how well we're understanding it and if he needs to go over it furthermore to make sure everyone understands what we're doing. I'm not sure if uh, you guys have received the email or not, but I can quickly start up a presentation. And so we have some questions in here. If you have on your um, iPads the eAudience app, all you have to do is open it up and right away it's already started up. So what you can do is just put your name in, it'll hook up to the network and just await your questions. You have to make sure that you connect to the Apple network. Right, it has to be on the Apple network to work that uh, we just set up.
So as you can see on mine, the, it'll tell you exactly which students logged in. So one of them was student, and obviously Mr. Neville is there. And as you answer the questions, it'll show them up um, on the screen in green. So that'll let me know that that person has answered the question. And I can look at each individual, or I can look at the overall results. So if either of you want to just pick an answer for the question, it doesn't have to be correct. The program doesn't know anyway. So we have one answer submitted and then the other. And if I click on results, it'll tell me the results of the class. So just by chance, you both picked B, and 100% have gone in with that. And as well, if you look at the iPads, you'll have the results as well in front of you. So what we can use this for is if the you know, if the students are getting this incorrect in the middle of doing notes, we actually did this today, this is a question from today, then I can immediately know that we need more questions on this or we need a different explanation and we don't have to wait till the next day, wait till they get it wrong in the homework. We can do it right away. So go back to the presentation. functions um, and on paper it's not as easy to do so with the iPads um, we're allowed to graph any function and rotate it and it's right there for us Studio, we have a full graphing calculator which allows us to actually use it in class instead of buying one for, I don't know, it could be expensive for certain kids. With the Math Studio, you can type in any function. function, double click, and you can zoom in to the finest line and see how close it is and what number it's on. And then you can go, it goes on forever, and just, it tells you everything that you need to know. It allows us to do online homework, which is better for kids instead of having them bring home their books, and it sometimes can hurt their back, so it makes it more convenient. And uh, the video lessons and hints, I'll show you guys. The hints it it shows us what to do and explains what to do. And for the video, in this lesson, we will learn how to solve all these step to do. equations, which is equations that have to be done using multiple steps. So let's do a couple of them. First one is four times n. Um, we took our terms <coughs> on the iPads, so we didn't have to yeah. go through all of our notes and a whole bunch of stuff. We could just look back in our note. We did. We could just look back in our notes, and we didn't have to write down all of like the fine stuff. We could just go through the white paper, or if you want to call it, on the iPad. And then you can just scroll right back to the where you were taking the midterm. And then if, when we do our homework on it, we have to get 7 out of 10, or else we have to go back in it. And we have to do another 10. And you have to keep doing it until you get a 70 or better. So it helps you to know what you need to work on. They give us an amplifier.
That's just the, mic the back page for the microphone. <laughs> if, say, we got a 6 out of 10, like this is what happened today. We, he gave us an assignment, and I got a 6 out of 10. So it gives us another thing to do, and it gives us one question. And it'll tell us, it'll give us the uh, qu question, and then it'll make us answer it. And if we got it wrong, it would make us do another one, and it would show us why. Okay. And it, it shows and explains why we got it wrong. So just a little bit more with the 10 marks. The interactive lesson that you see there is if the student doesn't do well, it's actually full instruction for the student, all based online. The program creators of 10 marks create these amplifiers as they go, and there's one for every single lesson. So not every student is going to need every amplifier because they might understand that well or be able to move on without needing it. However, if they get below a 7 out of 10, <coughs> it'll automatically assign that, so it's an automatic tier 2 intervention, and they can get some extra help that they need. As well, once uh, Kyle completes that interactive lesson, it'll assign him a set of problems again to verify that he now understands it. Um, the last thing, real quick, is just a little bit of uh, preliminary data based on the iPads and especially the use of 10 marks. So we gave a baseline assessment at the beginning of the year, and in the blue there, that's what the uh, average class score was for class one and class two. And we just gave it during midterm time um, during that extra period, we have the baseline a second time. And on average, there's a 94% increase in results. So the students, on average, doubled their score, whatever they got previously. Um, we're going to do this as well again at the end of the year to uh, verify these results, and hopefully they'll go up a little further. And then at the end, we'll also compare this to other classes who don't have the iPads, who don't have 10 marks, and see if the increase in results was greater as a result or was it the same. And we're just looking at this program and some other things to try to verify, you know, their effectiveness in the classroom. So, if there's any questions, thank you very much. I'm sure we have questions. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll start down here with uh, Jen. Go to Joyce uh, down um, here. I want to thank you so much. This is a wonderful, and I'm a math geek, so I absolutely love all this. Um, which classes are you using it for? Just Algebra 1 or? I'm using it for Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 currently. Okay. And then um, on the e-clicker, that's just immediate. You're just using that in the classroom, correct? Correct. Okay. Yep. And with the, the Math Studio and the Quick Graph, do you feel as though if students had this, they would, or if, you know, if they had them also at home, on their own devices, they wouldn't need the graphing calculator that we now require them to purchase? Uh, right, this actually does more than the average graphing calculator does. So this would be more equivalent to a TI-89 or a TI-Inspire than even a TI-83 or 84. Okay. Yep. And then on the 10 mark, I noticed you wrote online homework. Are the children bringing home their iPads or are they just connecting at home through a website? Um, they're bringing them home at times, and when we do the flipped classroom, they're working on a main class on the iPads as well. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Mrs. Holt? Yes, my question. Okay. Mrs. Suzette? Now you're part of the pilot program. Correct. Okay, you put in an application. And yep. So are these part of the required programs that you've had to, or are these ones that are in addition to? Um, we, well, the way that was set up, we don't have any required programs. We have to collect data on some of these apps and report back to show student growth. There's nothing that says you have to use one over the other. Okay, thank you. Anybody down here? I've got a couple of questions here. Uh, Mr. Gaffney, as you're doing this, uh, uh, everybody in the class has an, an iPad, yep. and they have that digital whiteboard, or, or whatever you call it. Um, are you able to see, if, if you ask a student to show their work, or whether can they, can they, they run it through the projector or whatever and show it on the screen to the whole class of what they're doing? Or um, They can. I have it password protected, so they can't just display whatever they want, whatever they feel like, because it just, as we could tell here, this one I didn't set the password currently so that we could switch back and forth right. relatively easy. If I want a student to show something, I can just grab their iPad real quick, type in the password, and it, it'll show up. Okay, in terms of the, um the data that you're collecting, or the the um, 
uh, homework data. Is that going into their grade, or is, is that coming right back to your um, your iPad? Uh, what's nice about 10 marks is, and actually I can show you real quick, it collects all the data for us, and it gives us time on task. It gives us everything we want to know about what we're doing. Yeah, short of using it. <laughs> so this is what I see on a daily basis when I go into 10 marks. So I can pick any one of my classes. I have four classes here. And it gives you a quick little pie chart on the left. Um, the red is if students got below 7 out of 10. The um, yellow is right in the middle, so if they had a 7 or a 6 even. And then the green is if they had an 8, 9, or a 10 out of 10. And what I can do is I can click on any of the students' data, and it'll show me exactly what they're doing on specific questions. I can go into reports. This is all tied to the Common Core. I can get and see exactly which strands they've been working on lately. Because uh, we just did the midterms. So let's go. So these are all some of the strands that the students have been working on. Let's let me scroll down. So this is the algebra strand, and if I double click on that, it'll break it down further into the subsets of the strand as well. So this is all data that we don't use necessarily on a daily basis, but if we want to see how a student's progressing through the Common Core, we can pretty easily. Here's all the students as far as what they've done, how much practice they had. So literally, I have this one student on the right who his mother loves 10 marks so much, she makes him do an hour of it every night. <laughs> so as you can see, he uh, is much higher than the others for time on task, as you can see by the graph. But really, a lot of data for anything you want. I can go to specific assignments. And to answer your question about that, um, I can go to open assignments or completed assignments. And because all the students are alphabetical, I'll actually leave this open while I work on my laptop at school. It's all alphabetical, I just load it right into the grading program, and this does count as a grade for their homework. Fantastic. Does it help at all with youngsters who are out sick or something like that in terms of catching up? Because they keep tabs on the assignments and strands that you're working on, right? Exactly, so if they're out sick, all they have to do is log on 10 marks and see if there's an assignment assigned. They'll be able to see it right away, and they can do that. As well as what we've done for Algebra 2 with all the video lessons online. Um, I've been updating that, so all of Chapter 5 in Algebra 2 is on there. We're starting on the next chapter, which is dealing with exponents. That'll be up there. So if a student's absent, they can go watch the video. They can get the full notes. This is exactly as I would teach it in the class, with examples done out and everything. They take the notes at home, they come into class, and then work on the problems, so that if they need help, I'll be able to help them there. So on a snow day, you could just send them the assignment, right? They, they yeah, I mean, on a snow day, I'm getting a cut off here for my the students. I just want to, there's a school up in Burlington, Mass, that's uh, having the kids do work on snow days. Not that I'm encouraging them. Uh, work is fine. Uh, I, I think um, I, you're teaching a regular algebra class without the iPads, and you're teaching this one. Do you find a difference, a, a big difference, in terms of the way you present or the uh, the, the, how the students learn? <coughs> um, yes, actually. The, uh, the students love working on the iPads, first of all. So it, it gets them enthusiastic about the learning, about the programs that we're using. And what's nice about the Apple TV is I can essentially teach the class from anywhere in the room. Mm -hmm. So in the digital whiteboard, I can go to the digital whiteboard, write out the problems, write in the whiteboard. And I could be standing in the back corner. I could be standing near the kid who I know is always trying to get away with you know, going somewhere else on the iPad. And I can just go wherever I'd like and help students as I go while they're working on the problems on the board. So the Apple TV was a great tool once that came. So you can, you can uh, pull videos in, you can do whatever you need to do, or, or you could do a demonstration beforehand and actually show that, right? Right, and I have it set up to the speakers as you heard today, right. all the videos. I can go to YouTube if I want to show a quick little video clip and other things. Okay, I have another question, but I'll go sure. right to Donna. I know we've done a lot of improvements in our IT, Uh, not currently. Um, they set up the Apple network, and right now I'm the only one using it. <laughs> so It's very fast. <laughs> yeah, it's very fast right now. Um, 
they are doing the upgrade in IT, all the uh, uh, servers to increase megabytes yeah, per yeah, area. Yeah. So that sh should help improve this as well. The Apple TV, or uh, the network that the Apple TV is on, the Apple network is password protected. So unless a teacher has the Apple TV, they wouldn't necessarily know that password. And the student's phones won't automatically update because without that password. So therefore, it's really cutting down on the bandwidth you know, that's being used up. Okay, thank you. How long have you been using this new classroom? Um, the Apple TV, we've been, I've been using for about, let's say about a month. Um, we got it going at Fermi to start, and actually with uh, Carl Merrick, we've just been working, and he just opened it up to all of Fermi and all of JFK, and I think they're working to open it up across the town as well. Fantastic. Let me ask the students. You folks have taken a regular math class, and you've taken this math class. Which one are you learning uh, uh, the most in? How do you feel about it? Do you like it or you don't like it? I personally like using the iPads because I never have to bring a math book home. But yeah, it's, it's a lot better than a regular math class. More interactive, definitely. How the rest do you feel? Is it easier or harder? Is it more fun to learn? or? Um, sometimes, like doing the flip classroom where we have to watch the video at home, it gets like a little bit more confusing because we can't ask Mr. Gaffney a question right away. Um, but then the next day in class, doing assignments with our book or on the iPads, we can ask him right away. So, it's, it's good. Uh, Mr. Gaffney, in terms of um, keeping tabs on grades and things like that. Is it any more work, less work, uh, doing it the way you're doing it right now? Um, in some ways, it's actually much less work. For example, we did the midterms for Algebra 1 um, with the permission of our department head and administrators completely on the 10 marks program. So as far as correcting, the kids knew exactly what they got immediately as soon as they were done with the midterm. And I just had to transfer it over to the grade book. And you're able to do that electronically? Yep. Fantastic. Well, not electronically from there, but I just had to type it in, and okay. it's all in alphabetic, so it doesn't take very long time. Yeah, okay. Any other questions here? Yeah, I have another one. Oh, I'm sorry. Jen. If, um, if let's say, because you said you taught Algebra 1 and Algebra 2, if in September you basically already have everything written out, I assume the whole curriculum and, and everything, if somebody needed to walk in as an Algebra 2 teacher next year, you could be able to, with their iPads, a whole class would be able to go through it with even a teacher that maybe wasn't familiar with algebra Two. do you think? Like a math instructor maybe that had taught geometry or something before. Right, and that's, especially the 10 marks is extremely useful because it has that teaching tool built in, mm -hmm. the amplifiers. Um, a number of our special education teachers at Fermi and at Field High have been set up with, through 10 marks as well mm -hmm. for the premium edition for students and they can just assign additional practice work to help their students and it will go through and teach it even though those particular teachers may not know that uh, particular curriculum very well. Okay. And the curriculum for the 10 mark is, is also common core and it's and you're finding vast enough stuff to work with that's applicable to what you need to teach at that time. Right and the uh, curriculum for 10 marks is actually the curriculum all the way through grade one through 12, essentially, all the way up through Algebra 2, they're working on pre-calculus. So if I know a student who's having trouble with fractions, for example, in Algebra 1 or even Algebra 2, I can go back to the 7th and 8th grade curriculum and give them, an give them specifically, not the whole class, an assignment on fractions so that they can work a little bit towards filling in the gaps that they've missed in years past. Excellent. Thank you so much. Sure. Would you want to go back to the textbook, but do you like doing it this way? Oh, I would never go back to the textbook. <laughs> I knew that was the answer. <laughs> That was, a, that was a softball question. <laughs> Any other questions, folks? Thank you very much. This is, uh, Thank you. This is exciting stuff, and uh, we'd love to have you come back and show us, uh, after you get a little more practice with it, come back towards the end of the year and let us see it. I think it would be Absolutely. great. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Thank folks. You. I'm sure I can't keep this, so I'll have to give it back to the young lady. I'd like to thank both groups. I think that it was fascinating. And I, I think it's got, it piqued our curiosity, and I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions and uh, maybe getting them back to you uh, to get some answers. At this point, it's time to move on to uh, item number six, audience participation. As if, Does anybody wish to speak uh, before the board, to the board? 
If you do, please sign up with Mrs. Zalicki. It's over there at the table. But is no one has signed up. No one has signed up? Would anybody like to come up and speak before the board? If, that's, if, if there is nobody coming up, then we'll move on to item 7, which is the 2013-14 uh, budget dis discussion. And I'll turn it again over to uh, Dr. Schumann to uh, introduce our pre presenters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Tonight, um, our Chief Academic Officer, Ms. Ann McKernan, is here with us, uh, and she is uh, going to be setting up a presentation here very shortly. Um, she's going to be reviewing some of the new initiatives in the budget related to uh, goal number one, which was implementing a rigorous curriculum with student assessment and, uh, and, and other uh, methodologies for improving student learning. And she's also going to talk a little bit about goal number four, which was expanding our data use capacity in terms of uh, building a, a true data warehouse where we can have uh, more instant access, much of what, like you saw with uh, the 10 marks, but on a, a more global and, and a wider basis across the district so teachers could use that um, formative assessment data to make good decisions in the classroom. So while they um, get this ready to go, we'll just Sit tight for a second. You do have uh, her presentation right here. Uh, just so you understand how the um, budget books uh, were set up, each time we give you something new, we've created a new tab for you. We'll be giving you some different things, and this one uh, will go behind the orange tab. So if you just lift it up, you should be able to open it up and insert the, tonight's presentation right into your budget book. And it works as a flip pad, and uh, We'll have some other things for you um, over the next couple of weeks and fill your book up on where you go. There it is. Good evening, everyone. It's good to see you again tonight. Mr. Barassa will be helping me to move the presentation through. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to speak with you tonight about achieving goal <coughs> one and goal four as laid out in the board priorities. Um, to start with goal one, we have been um, working all year and uh, since I've been on board and even before I came on board to align our curriculum to the new Common Core State Standards. And I know, I am aware that you as a board are becoming more and more familiar with these standards all the time. They are ambitious, they're from, uh, although they're voluntary, the state of Connecticut has signed on to them and um, they're pretty rigorous. So the process is um, not an easy one and it is one we work on every day. Our goal, the board goal was to develop a rigorous core curriculum, implement highly effective research-based instructional strategies, and make instructional decisions based on the close analysis of student performance data. If we move on to the next slide. <coughs> this goal was underpinned by a theory of action that said if the Enfield schools adopt rigorous curriculum standards, provide effective in, uh, professional development opportunities to educators to enhance their instructional practice and use student achievement data and informed decision making, then student outcomes will improve and students will be adequately prepared for college and career success. If you notice on the slide, I would, I've underlined and um, set off in red parts of this particular theory of action because there are several parts and I wanted to lay that out so you understand what uh, budget items um, align to which parts of this theory. On the next slide, we look at the components of goal one. So we talk about creating a rigorous curriculum. That's writing, revising, and aligning present curriculum and writing new curriculum where we need to. 
We also talked in, in this particular goal about ensuring we have highly effective instructional practices and the professional development that um, spawns that type of practice. And finally, there's an assessment component to this particular goal. If we move on to the next slide, we look at the component, the first component, component of goal one, which is the actual writing and revision of curriculum. As a, members of the curriculum subcommittee and members of the board know, the English language arts is presently being written and continues to be written. It is a, um, a, it is a challenging piece to write as it has writing and reading, speaking and listening, and conventions of language as subsets of the English language arts curriculum. In addition, it also has reading standards in uh, areas like so science and social studies. At the same time, there'll be new science standards coming out. The social studies curriculum itself must align to the common core reading expectations and writing expectations. In the area of math, we've made great progress on writing our curriculum, and the math team is focused now on assessments and performance tasks to support the implementation. Also, along the, uh, for the support of curriculum writing and alignment, we continue to need certain resources, not just to write and revise curriculum, but to implement. Across the district, when I speak with teachers and principals, it is clear that an elementary writing program is necessary. Uh, from the feedback I have gotten over time, uh, there has been less emphasis on writing, and teachers are employing different methods that they adopted over time, so they're not aligned in any way at this time. We brought in the Great Books program this year, which has many um, facets that align to the Common Core. First, it's very rigorous reading. Second, it encourages speaking and listening skills. Third, it has a great emphasis on vocabulary and reading comprehension. We'd like to expand that program. At the same time, the Lexile levels or the reading levels of the text that children are um, expected to master at various grade levels has increased in the Common Core. And that creates a situation where we need to look at our classroom libraries for novels and informational text and find an effective way to increase the academic difficulty of those books. And that can be through additional library resources. That could be through e-readers, e-reader programs, where up to 1,800 or 2,000 books can come with the programs aligned to the Common Core. And of course, the ongoing need for instructional supplies that are now aligned. If I move on to the next slide, and we look at the second component of goal one, we talk about highly effective instruction. In order to help teachers improve their practice, and they are on a continual journey of improvement, we use external professional learning opportunities when appropriate. We bring professionals into the district when appropriate. The Great Books program is an example of a resource that comes with a training program. We'd like to create an online laboratory um, because we'd like to highlight the great work of our teachers. We'd like to have all their resources in one place so they can quickly find these resources, their curriculum documents, the tools, the instructional tools they've all agreed to are highly effective. We'd like to um, showcase the um, great lessons and great ideas. You just saw some great lesson here tonight from Mr. Gaffney. It would be, um, it would be very wise of us to make sure that his knowledge base is spread to all these other teachers so that all teachers feel comfortable with educations and teachers feel comfortable with programs like 10 Marks. They may not all have the iPads, but despite that, they may be getting iPads over time, they, may, they can access these technologies with other types of, um, these access these resources with other kinds of technology. And um, they show that creative spirit in teaching where we need to get that, um, we need to open this talent up and have other teachers um, see that. And that's one of the goals of the Online Professional Development Laboratory, to spread great practice. Um, we also want to continue to target instructional opportunities for our children in small groups, in small academies, in various ways that we can enhance um, our instruction for students. Um, I was a teacher for many years, I was, a principal, I was fortunate to be a principal for many years, and I can tell you 
that when children have an opportunity to have instruction in a small group with their teacher at different times, it's, it's a great help to them. Um, there's even more personal connection. There's a little more time to uh, get to know each other. And I think these have to continue to be expanded. This year we started with the Student Support Academy. We've had its first week. We have great sign-ups for that. Um, one of our schools expected to have 30 children and 55. Um, that shows that children, um, you think, oh, you're going to stay after school from 3 to 6 o'clock and you're going to work. And that might sound like drudgery, but with high level of relationship, um, adding the appropriate um, time for relaxation, a few breaks, a, a snack to make sure that they're nourished, and good personal attention. The children, um, I have great reviews on week one and I look forward to week two. I want to look to expand programs like that. You just saw the power of the iPad consortium with Mr. Gaffney's presentation. Um, these are great resources for children to have. And there's so many. Uh, maybe, maybe 10 marks works for one child, but it's really the e-clickers that really um, helps another child because they, they're less afraid to give their answer because it's anonymous in class. So uh, to expand that consortium um, is really crucial. Um, the addition of the e-readers is also a very important piece of um, this goal. Uh, buying new libraries for all of the classrooms is going to be quite expensive. Um, I'd like to look at all of our options with e-readers so we can bring in thousands of titles to a classroom much more efficiently. If we move on to a third component of this first goal, it's assessment. Uh, our students are going to be taking uh, online assessment in a computer adaptive testing environment for the Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium in two years. Uh, there are ways we can start to give them experiences with um, computer adaptive testing as early as next year. The e-readers often have um, assessments built in where students get, get more and more used to these kinds of um, responses. And um, <coughs> those are some of the programs that uh, we are seeking to support goal one. I'd like to switch over to goal four for one moment. The goal four is to research, uh, design, and implement an integrated solution for collecting, warehousing, and analyzing student performance data. And uh, the products that are out there for us to do this are very powerful. I've been fortunate to have great experience using them. I can tell you as a principal one year, not only one year, I regularly access this data system 400 times a year. I would check in with it to see how my students were doing. I, I, I literally accessed it daily to see what growth students were making so we could target instruction. Um, the theory of action underpinning this goal is if all educators develop the skills to access and analyze student performance data, then instructional decisions will be informed by student performance data and educators will be able to target the specific needs of every student. A data warehousing system can provide um, provides educators the ability to track all students across all assessments because we can bring in national assessments, we can bring in state data, and with all of the local assessments that we offer, we can bring into the system. And when you look at a child, you can look at a child across all types of assessments. You can take this data and you can aggregate it for the district or across one or two schools. You can disaggregate the data by subgroups, by intervention groups, by classrooms, uh, by grade level. You can drill down through these systems to get to the individual questions. So, so many children miss question five. So many children miss question five. You can look at question five and look at the skill or the content knowledge it was assessing. You can further look at what is the most common wrong answer. And that tells you a lot as a teacher. When you can look at why would 70% of children choose question C when the answer was B. And you can start to understand their thinking on what led them to that question. <coughs> it also helps you track the effectiveness of your intervention systems. So if we have a tier three group that is going to receive 30 minutes of small group instruction four times a week over a period of six weeks, we can look if that group is making the type of progress or if that particular intervention isn't the right one. 
And in addition, with the new teacher evaluation system that has been, um, that is a requirement that we adopt, the new teacher evaluation system will be heavily based on student data. We will need this kind of a system in order for our teachers to assess their own growth to, towards their goals. When we look at the budget impact of these items, we're looking at expanding great books at a cost of $25,000, e-reader programs at a cost of $21,000, computer adaptive testing pilot at a cost of almost $15,000, creation of our online professional development lab at a cost of $50,000, the elementary writing program at a cost of $88,000, expanding the iPad consortium to 200 additional iPads at a cost of 100,000, and bringing in the first year of a data warehousing system at $23,900. These items are uh, total $322,300. And these are, the these are the new initiatives I believe that we need to achieve goal one and goal four. If we um, move along, the benefits will be that uh, we will have aligned our curriculum to the Common Core. We will create a performance tasks aligned to the Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium's expectations. We will have a very, very vibrant um, professional development laboratory that will house all of your teachers, uh, not all, many, many of your teachers' needs and will be a home for best practice. And it will be Enfields alone. It will be a source of pride for our teachers to show off all of that they do well. Through these programs, we'll be able to build teacher capacity, and they'll be able to share their capacity with others. Um, we will continue to expand our resources that meet Common Core state standards, especially in the area of novels and uh, reading materials that are aligned to the uh, new reading standards. We need a writing program. We desperately need a uh, new and uh, common and aligned writing program. We, we want to look for new and innovative ways to support students in targeted instruction. We'd like to expand the use of uh, expand our iPad consortium. Make uh, ensure that our students start to experience computer adaptive testing environments, and help our teachers to make solid instructional decisions based on student performance data. We believe that this expenditure of money will support these, um, will, uh, I'm sorry, this expenditure will help us attain these goals, goal one and four. And I can, I have time to take any questions you have. Thank you very much. Any questions, Jen? Hi, yeah. I have a couple questions. I don't know if you're allowed to give me the specific specifics on these but like on the e-reader program what do you implement what do you mean by that like you want to buy nooks for everybody is that what you're looking at or no uh, what, what we're, we're looking at, at is uh, there are several products on the market um, there's one called my reader there's one called benchmark universe there's one called big universe uh, these oh. are subscription programs that okay. we want to make sure that we have in all classrooms and that may be part of a solution to bringing our classroom libraries up to the level that they need to be. Um, so these can be accessed on other devices. They don't have to be on iPads or tablets. They can be on the classroom computer. They also may have home, on, um, home access. Okay. So that's what you're talking that's about. That's what e-reader subscriptions. Okay. And then... Um, the computer adapted testing is that to get up to where we're going to need to be in two years so the kids could, similar to what Mr. Gaffney did with having the kids do their midterms on their iPad. In some ways, there's, there are some programs on the market, one in particular that I've been looking at, that we would pilot, that I propose to pilot in uh, certain grades next year where students would have the experience of taking um, three benchmark tests during the year in this computer adaptive testing environment and we could benchmark their scores. Um, it is very similar, we believe, to what the Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium testing environment will look like. Okay. And then the data warehousing, will that be a software or would that be like a web-based product? This thing is that we will do, web-based? Yeah, we'll just have to get the subscription mm -hmm. to and put everything in? And it'll tie into our presence soon. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Tina and then Tom. 
Yes. Okay, so on your um, on one of your sections in your um, presentation, you talk about expanding the Student Support Academy and a credit recovery program, obviously, for the older kids. Um, I am one of the parents that have been able to take advantage of the Student Support Academy, and um, my third grader is in it at Whitney, and he loved it last week. So, you know, it was the first week, so it was exciting. So let's see how he does next week. But I'm, uh, I'm really, I'm so happy because it, it can give a little bit more above and beyond of what I can give, and, and that small instruction is really, is really great. I'm so excited that we can offer this to the parents, and I'm so happy that the numbers came in the way they came in. It would be great if we got even more, but hey, baby steps, and, and that right. was great. Uh, uh, thank, you, thank you for letting us pilot that this year because it really helps us to see if it's going to catch on. My, my feeling, of course, is that it is. That's why I propose it. But um, I, I appreciate the board's support in, in uh, letting us have this uh, experience now so I can see if we can expand. Also, the online learning laboratory, I remember when we first met you, we got to see a glimpse of that. And um, I, I really like that um, with the teachers. Like you said, the teachers want to be in their classrooms teaching. And to uh, be able to capture that and, and make an online learning laboratory is so wonderful. Um, I guess my question, those are my comments. And then I guess my question would be, when we're talking about budget impact, we're talking more, um, a lot of this is falling under technology. Are we looking more of like a technology? Maybe this is just a statement. We'll discuss it later. But is this going to be something we would com come out of our te technology component more so than because we kind of treat all the technology separately? Um, these items are earmarked in instructional, um, new instructional programming, and there always is uh, there is a heavy component here. You're absolutely right for technology, the online lab. Um, I view that as really tied to goal one very, um, very much. I'm, I'm a strong believer that we need to celebrate the good work of our teachers, and that we need to showcase them and show them, because I believe that um, we have a great deal of knowledge in the district, and that by um, Highlighting, uh, teaching as often as you probably all know, a very individualized activity. You, you teach and no one is present but the children, so you don't get to share your good work. I believe this is a way we can share that. And there's a heavy tech component in many of these, but we have grouped these under new um, costs for instruction. Okay. Mr. Shroy? Just a couple of really basic questions. Sure. Um, you're saying that you're, you're Students' individual records of books, academic records, will be stored in, in the cloud or wherever. <coughs> Will the parents have access to that? Um, that's a that's a good question, Mr. Sart. Um, the particular program that I've had the most experience with, and actually happens to be the one that talks to eSchool because it was created by the same company, Sungard. Um, I don't know what to have a parent portal at this time. However, that being said, um, these companies are in such um, strong competition that they often look for you know, the next advantage. And um, certainly eSchool has a portal to see grades. So uh, my answer right now is no, but I don't think that's a hard no. I think it's uh, probably a not yet. The other question? If, if, if I could just interject a little bit in there, it all depends on what we want to show them, too. Um, if they want access to CMT scores, CAP-related scores, and that uh, these are all things that we can decide um, what we're going to have to give them access to. And the fact of choosing a product that is so well tied into our present student management information system is going to give us a lot more flexibility that we don't have to worry about mapping certain areas to have access to. And uh, so that is one of the keys to this product. As, as a parent, I would want to have access to everything that Absolutely. my child is exposed to. And if my parent portal exposes me to a limited content so that I don't see exactly what my child is doing, I'd be very angry at it. Um, I want to be able to know how my child is doing with the teacher's evaluations of my child are in process, especially since we're streamlining. Yeah. And also, I would also want to know what the curriculum is. Um, I want to know what my child's child is being taught and, and have access to that and not be restricted to it. Mm -hmm. So it's just, uh, just a Curiosity, I guess. As we build the um, online professional development laboratory, 
um, I often think as it grows, and it will, it will be a process of what and where uh, the parent access is appropriate to the curriculum, for instance, and instructional tools. Um, and I often think about what student access would be appropriate to, is that where online classes could be housed. Um, if we wanted to have such a thing as one or two courses, and then maybe they wouldn't be even in credit bearing areas, maybe they're interest areas. So I think there's a lot here that allows us the capacity to build and have a vision for moving forward. Um, so I thank you for considering all those requests. Uh, Jen? Oh, just in remark to what Tom's saying, um, you know, we have the Home Access Center at home, and obviously I have the 17 year old where I can see his grades and everything like that and I somewhat know what he's being taught but um, my fourth graders grades are also accessible I, I don't think they're supposed to be but they are and I I know that yeah he's a he's a little pilot and his teacher's not supposed to know. so hopefully she's not watching tonight but like, he, I know what my son's spelling grades are and everything, like what he's getting out of social studies, but I don't <coughs> need to know what every benchmark that he hits. And is that's sort of, I assume, what would be in the data mining. I don't need to know what reading level he is. I need to know what his spelling test grade is and everything like that, and that's what I currently have the access to, but I don't need to know every benchmark. I think it's different data sometimes. Am I wrong? But that's what kind of data, as a parent, I want to know what he's being graded on. And when I go to the teacher-parent conference, they may say, you know, his reading level is a 38 or whatever. But I don't feel as though I need to know every benchmark that he's achieved. And I wouldn't be able to interpret it, but I would like to know what grade he gets on his spelling test and his social studies test every week. So I just think it's two different things, what the data mining is and what a parent needs to know. I'm not arguing about the data mine. I, I just, I, I, as a parent, I watch my child every action, and I interact with them at, when it comes to the, what, what he's doing in school. We, we monitor. I mean, we monitor a lot. We're there for the spelling tests and see how they did the spelling right. test. We're there for the math, and we also talk to our teachers on a regular basis to make sure that our kids are in line. And I want to make sure that that's part of this program. Is the only question that I'm asking. I, want, I don't want to have a wall between me and my teacher, or my child's teacher. I want to have the same level of access, because it's my child, the same level of access that that teacher has so that I can address the concerns at home before they become a concern at the PTO level, okay, a parent-teacher conference level. Right. Okay. I think a lot of the access, <laughs> just in terms of data mining, which we've been looking for forever, is to get some kind of measure or get some kind of analysis on how the, how our overall population is doing on particular strands and things like that, uh, and and looking at how we're being successful as teachers on on those kinds of things as well. And I think you're looking at TAC. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the Home Access Center. We you're getting those actual grades and actual test grades, which is exactly what you're looking for. It just comes out of a different function, I think, of, of the program. And I think as it evolves, because we have to tell it what we want to collect. Uh, what type of data is valuable to us and, and what we want to carry over time and, and so on. And, and not all data has, is of equal value, as, as we all know. Um, the other thing, I want to get into just a couple of things in, in terms of the budget itself. <coughs> Some of these things, grade books, uh, the e-reader program, uh, computer adaptive testing, and, and those kinds of things. Are those one-time expenses or are those annual expenses? Okay. So that's a great question, of course. Um, the grade books training would uh, it, the 25 is negotiable in how much training you want to bring in in a given year, but until all the teachers have the training, it would be ongoing. So and that's, all, that's all professional development, the great books training? Yes. Okay. The e-reader program is subscription. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, that would be annual then. Right. Okay. The uh, computer adaptive testing, um, I believe this would be almost like a bridge. We wanted our students to have the experience so that they're not completely they, so that when they take the uh, Smarter Balance assessments, they, they feel somewhat comfortable in that environment. Um, eventually, Smarter Balance will have its own assessments, and we'll have to look at the, uh, their own formative assessments, not just the summative, the big one. Um, and we'll have to look at what pricing they have or what comes with theirs. But this is, this is an idea to have a bridge to that. 
um, because the children need to be feel comfortable in order to perform. The professional development lab is likely to be a high first time cost and a lower ongoing cost. Okay. Um, the writing program is much more a, a one time and then we look to see uh, if there's any other resources, but it, again, it'll likely be a high cost initially and then it will drop down significantly. Um, the iPads, would, my guess is that we would continue to look to, ex to expand to get new ones, to get more um, tablets out into the hands of students. Um, and the data warehousing system is um, a program that will come in at a certain cost, an implementation cost at a higher level, and it would drop down to probably half or less than half the cost in for the upkeep. Just going back to the iPad consortium uh, uh, issue, which I'm really pleased with what these folks are doing. I think given more time, that we're going to be you know, tremendously excited by the creativity they come up with uh, in those classrooms. Um, but looking at cost, I mean, anything we get with this is, is uh, technology yeah. is a cost. Um, and, I, and I'm noticing that they're not using the textbook, they're, using the, well, they're not using it as much, not as the primary uh, right. source tool here. Uh, are you looking, or is your department looking at uh, getting uh, individual iPads? I mean, but, uh, and are you looking at the idea of subscriptions for textbooks rather than spending $100 per textbook? Uh, uh, because there are some economies of scale in, in, in looking at it that way. I, don't, I just don't know whether you're, if, if we're going to keep buying 200 uh, iPads, we're going to be at the point where there could be enough for Every, right. every kid to right. do one and use one, and I'm wondering if you're looking at those economies down the line. Well, one example of that is the e-readers. I could I could easily write down uh, instead of putting an e-reader program out there for you to talk about, I could actually say we need to upgrade all of our classroom libraries from grade K to mm -hmm. eight, and. Um, because a classroom library is a traditional part of an elementary school classroom. There should be a library of books that students can grab at any time, but that e-reader is an example of saying, wait a minute, maybe we should, with the expansion of these iPads, look at e-readers, which bring in 1,800 titles at a lower cost. So um, I don't think we look at every decision that way yet, but I think we're getting there. We're looking at more and more decisions that way. What is, a, what is another, um, another solution? Um, to the, the traditional textbook. Um, and certainly the tablets have so many um, applications. Uh, so the answer is yes, and we need to continue. I, I just, it, as you go on, I think this board that we're using the tablets, they, they, I think they, they've saved us money, and I know they certainly saved Mrs. Zalicki a lot of uh, times, like two hours every week of putting our stuff together. We're not killing as many right. forests as we right. were before. Um, we can actually find the stuff now instead of going through 100 pages of stuff, which is great. Um, but I think there's some efficiencies here, and I think yeah, I, for one, and I think maybe some of the others. But if, as you see those kinds of things, give us a lead into that. And say we need to look for efficiencies in our budget. I know I, I speak for Mrs. Sack, but when I say that, she's always looking for those. Sure. And if this is a way to do this over the long term, even if it's something we bring in gradually, <coughs> you know, yeah, we'd never be able to do everything all at once. But if we do it gradually. And, and pilot it and come back with some assessments on how much we save. Is it a better way to do it? As, the, as we heard from these young sisters today, that would be good for us. Well, one of the things, just to let you know, and I think you, you made a, a allusion to this, is um, what, what are you collecting data on, Mr. Gaffney? It was basically your question. And uh, 10 Marks was a program I really introduced Mr. Gaffney to and said, please, um, please look at this. I've used it in my other districts. I liked it. Um, please, and, and I think. Um, that uh, that's, that's an important component. We have some of the first um, data pieces coming in right now from the iPad Consortium 1 where teachers are sending me comparison data to, to try to determine if these are making uh, uh, a difference in the classroom on the learning side. So um, I, I look forward to presenting that to you as well because there's, there are, there's just so many uses and, and um, efficiencies, not just in cost, but in time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. One of the big efficiencies in time here is the data warehousing system. How much time do our teachers use now to mine through data and highlight on paper and transfer from the sheet to another? And if we spend the money to, to, to get a system and the right um, setup for that system, it will be as easy as scanning um, scanning a document or making a copy, making copies of the student work and that gets scanned into a computer and the computer reads it. And there are efficiencies in time, <coughs> money, 
and um, certainly in um, in other resources. Question of historical data. No, no, I I understand that piece, but I just. Uh, uh, thankful that they are now using these. For, they're probably paying a couple of bucks for the the uh, graphic calculator app that I spent a hundred bucks a piece for the four TI-83s that I bought for my four kids. That's a perfect example. <laughs> the um, the cost of a TI-83, 84 Inspire yep. is easily ninety to a hundred. Yeah. Yeah. The Inspire maybe is hundred yeah. and thirty, and you need classroom sets of those, and you need many classroom sets yes, of those. And now you're looking at. Um, apps that are 99 cents yeah. or a dollar 99. I love it. Uh, Tom and then Jen. Oh, and Mr. Neville, not to interrupt, but just to let you also know, the new Smarter Balance assessments are going to have calculators just like the ones you can buy for the apps. So it's not only smart because it saves money, that's the environment they may use. The online calculators that they use when they go into Smarter Balance for math um, I've been told, I haven't seen it yet, that you'll be able to download that as an app. So you'll have experience using the actual one that they that's will be great. using. So that's another, if that's an efficiency, maybe that's just smart thinking, uh, whatever it is, it's good. Well, we stop buying all those calculators and <laughs> buying the batteries every year that uh, the batteries. hundreds and hundreds of calculators. Tom? I'm, I'm all about finding efficiencies. It's, it's, okay. it's, it's, I knew that. It, I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, long term, <laughs> I, Apple is, is very famous for short-term <coughs> shelf life. The, the, the new product that comes out is now obsolete after six months and you have to get another one. <coughs> um, if, well, if you talk to some of the Apple folks, they are obsolete <laughs> and, and are, are close to obsolete. It's a personal opinion, but um, I know some of the... I grew up with Apple Computer and, and we were obsoleted out of the market when they decided not to support them with software problems. And, and that's their track history. Um, I was there for the Apple II and the 2GS and, and, and the history of computers. I'm showing my age, I know. And, but, and I've seen it in similar applications like with the iPhone. So um, my concern would be that, and again, the machine is only as good as the software as it supports. And if our subscription fees continue to increase, which they have a tendency of doing, we may not be as efficient. And I would feel a whole lot more comfortable saying, okay, this is a this is a great idea. If there was an academic support to it, if there was proof that this is helping academically. Because I again it's it's not always about money, but it's about what's best for the kids' achievement at an academic level. And I understand that so far, you know, what we see with the ten marks, it seems to be working that way. Um, again, I'd be a lot more comfortable. Having run a business and been involved in business, I've been sold technology that was told was this the right. answer to all of my prayers, and then have it turn out that it was again obsolete after two years. Can I address just a little bit of that? Um, Smarter Balance has already put out a chart for us, telling us the number of years that they will go out and support the product. And right now, iOS 6 will be supported up to seven years, and so they're already giving us charts and telling us that Windows XP, they're going to start to push out the door finally in that uh, in, in encouraging people to go to Windows 7. And if I think we can get seven years out of any product, I think we're doing a fantastic job. Okay. And, and I certainly our turnaround, we hope, is going to be less than that. But I think seven years, I feel very, very comfortable with being able to get there. And that's why I asked the question. And I, and I, I love the question. Thank you very and much for to, asking. And to just answer you on one other piece is we are having the teachers look at this data. Um, so specifically per app. So I've asked teachers to look at the data per app. So say if you're using IXL in your classroom, if you're using 10 marks, can you, can you uh, look at a group that's not using that and see if they've made that progress? I had several conversations on that today. One teacher told me, this is a teacher from Barnard School, that um, she believes, and she's gathering her data, it's due to me the end of this week, um, she believes that the student's ability in the area of addition in first grade is greatly improved because of um, some curriculum changes, because it's never just one thing, and, um, but also because of um, their, uh, their exposure to the application, especially one called um, extra math, which is effect fluency, 
program, a free one, by the way. You'll really like that efficiency. It's a free program. Uh, so we are looking at that, um, and that was part of the consortium um, application that you'd be willing to track some student data. Jen? Um, I just want to say, on some of these um, software packages that you're talking like in big, big universe, I just was looking for the kids to do something on their snow day, and that was a snow package that another school system had. And these two already got my email going, do we have a subscription to this? Because I think a lot of these things in the past, possibly we had a subscription to for one particular school or something like that, but I would like to see more district ones so yes. that I can utilize it at home with my children. And like 10, um, 10 mark is, it's not a an app, it's an actual website, correct? Ten marks is a subscription that we have X amount of seats for the students. Okay, but it there's <coughs> actually a free version of Ten Marks <coughs> that <coughs> Mr. Gaffney happened to be using before I recommended it. And he said, Oh, I'm already using as you can tell he's a very bright young man. Yeah. And uh, he was already using that before and then I said, Well I'd like to get you the full subscription version so we can see have a teacher really test it with a class and tell me if this is a um, a good program. Just to give you an example, for the younger children, we bought a, a hundred IXL seats yep. because my experience is that it's better for the younger kids and for the older children we went with the 10 marks. And so I'm getting feedback from the teachers um, and they, as I said they have data that they, they're going to give me every two months. Their first point is the end of this week. And um, they're comparing to see if these products seem to make a difference. I, I can't always isolate them. There's curriculum changes, there's other things that happen, but um, I, I look forward to showing you some of the, what they show me. And I think it's, it's very good with like individual learning because I know when, when we have these different things, there are parents that yes, you know what, there's parents out there as we know don't read to their children and don't do this. But if I'm able to download Splash Map and you know, when Drew comes home, I hand him the iPad and I go, here's your five minutes of math. And then, you know, so I think these are things that even parents, not just um, the, the educators want. It's something parents want access to at home so we can actually watch something that our kid does in school set and, you know, be able to get an email and see how they're doing. So I think it's something that just the parents alone out in the community is also looking for. And it, I mean, if it's something district-wide that we can purchase, I, I would highly you know, enjoy it for the children. It's just advertising and getting it out there that these things are possible and free stuff. Any other questions? <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Kieran. I appreciate it. And uh, it's nice to know that you have all these teachers who are trying out all these things, you're piloting them, and you're you're getting all that data back about what's what's is is good, what what is uh, you know, not not as good, what which ones are we going to keep? And we recommend other people. So uh, I, we appreciate all the effort that you put into that. Thank you for supporting both the Student Support Academy and the iPad Consortium because those are both pilots, and without those pilots, we can't speak to you. Um, with any points of reference. So thank you for supporting. Thank you very much. Thank Moving on to item number eight, the fiscal year 2013-14 school calendar. It's that time again. Dr. Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you have two calendars with you, and I'd like to walk you through um, both of them and make the comparisons. Per board policy, uh, you begin to look at the calendar in January and you adopt the calendar in February. And I would suspect that we would put this back on the regular board meeting for February 26 for your final <coughs> adoption of, of a calendar for this year. Um, we created a new calendar and we're in the process of editing the calendar as, as always with the uh, bargaining units, the uh, Enfield Teachers Association, Enfield School Administrators Association, <coughs> regarding the things we're trying to accomplish. But one of the things that we're required to do um, with the new uh, professional development plan, evaluation plan, is provide ongoing job embedded continuous professional development. And if we look at the yellow um, calendar, which is your current calendar, we've highlighted in blue the professional development days. And we circled in red the full days, and the other three are half days. You can see that we front load in August with four days, and then we don't do any professional development with our staff for three whole months. And we get them for a half a day in December, 
Then we take another month off and we get them back to back weeks in February. Then we take another month off and we get a day in April, a half day in May, and then we're done. And in order to get anything any continuous traction for anything, it's very difficult with that much time. That's at least three days that we didn't have before this calendar. Three half days, I should say. Okay. So those were new. In this calendar? I think it was this calendar, wasn't it, Chris? So we had, we had some half days, but we had half days <coughs> year in before the spring, that. In the spring, we had these extra three, which had not been available before. So this is actually an increase. Oh, well, that's good then. <laughs> um, what we have proposed, uh, if you take a look at the colored version of 2013 14, the professional development are in the light and dark uh, purple shades. The Days which are full days are in the darker purple with the white lettering. They occur three in the beginning of the year, one in October, one in November, and one in May. And then we are proposing a seven um, day, half day system with the half days coming on the Tuesday. And one of the uh, part, uh, parts of the agreement that you have with the teachers associations, you can have up to four on Tuesdays which extend the day to the regular meeting time day, which means you could have a three-hour professional development on a Tuesday afternoon four times a year. That, that's something you have. The others would have to be two-hour professional developments because you only have in the contract, you're only allowed to put up to four on those days. So with, the, uh, with this plan, you can see that we've covered all the months, we're able to touch base with people, we're going to be able to do the things that we need to do through professional development. We're going to be talking about the new evaluation plan, we're going to be talking about Common Core. We're going to be able to talk about the security things that we need to talk about in training our staff. We're going to be able to work with teachers on things like the technology that Ann talked about. Give them time to access the online professional development laboratory and also talk about data analysis strategies and, and techniques. So those are things we're able to do on an ongoing basis, mixed in throughout the year, and have monthly contact through professional development with our staff. In terms of the impact, we have to make a couple of assumptions. First of all, if full day kindergarten is put into place, then the yellow things that you see on there and the red over on the far right all go away because there will not be a need for a full day of no kindergarten on November the 8th because those um, conferences will be embedded into those two green days which is currently taking place. And all of the uh, calendars, the way they're adjusted for hours, with the AM, PM don't happen because they follow the regular K2 schedule. Now what that does is those two green days on the 12th and the 15th inadvertently became half days at the secondary level. The reason they became half days at the secondary level is we had to run, we couldn't get the buses to take the elementary students home and get back in time to pick up the high school. But if we go to full day kindergarten, we don't have the midday runs, elementary will have half days on the green days, the high school will be able to stay in session because the students will leave on the last bus at 120 and the buses can get back to the high school for 202 to pick up the second uh, high school runs and then subsequently after that they'll pick up the JFK. So we pick up uh, four hours of instruction, there are two hours of instruction there uh, on each day or four hours of instruction at the high school level that we've lost this year because we couldn't do that. That's what full day K will be. Because I know you're looking at, at the total number of hours. If we up this, we're going to be upping, we'll take four additional two-hour afternoons for professional development, which means we lose eight hours of instruction. <coughs> and for that, we gain nine hours of professional development, because one of those can be a three-hour, the other three are going to be two-hour. So we would get nine hours of professional development for eight hours of instruction. At the high school level, going to full-day kindergarten, we get four hours back from that one, one thing that happens right there. Uh, this year, for some reason, and it was kind of unknown to folks, uh, you, the day before uh, the Christmas vacation, the 21st, was a half day for everyone. In this calendar, we return that to a full day. We pick up two more hours of instruction. So we've picked up six hours, and we've traded eight hours for nine hours of professional development. So there are, there are some things going back and forth where we feel that the value added from A, the additional <coughs> professional development, and B, spreading it out, making it continuous over the course of the year, uh, will certainly offset the couple of hours of instruction that we, we might have to uh, uh, trade for that. <coughs> um, in addition, uh, the other days that are on here, 
are, are highlighted for you so you can see when school starts on September 3rd. Uh, school will be scheduled to end on June 13th. The fixed graduation dates would be the 19th and 20th, flip-flopping this year with Enfield High School going first and Fermi High School going second next year. And uh, all the additional days that are built into the calendar are for holidays and vacations are, are there as well. So this is something that the board can begin to consider. We can put it back on the agenda after you've had a chance to look at it for discussion. It can be brought up in various subcommittees and then uh, sometime before February, probably at the February 26th meeting, we will put it back on for adoption. But I'll take any questions you have tonight. Any quick questions for uh, Dr. Schumann regarding the calendar? Just take a good look at it and we'll bring it back on the 26th. Very good. Okay, <coughs> moving on to item nine, board member comments. And I'll start down here with uh, Jen. I don't have anything. Mrs. Hall? Somewhere there's a paper here. To remind you all that the correct legislative breakfast is February 7th, which is just a week from this coming Thursday. It's coming up very rapidly. Uh, among the legislative agenda for CREC is their priority one, which we will all agree with, predictability for school districts. And that includes knowing the amount for excess cost grant, um, predictable expectations concerning the minimum budget requirement, which has been changing almost every legislative session, and potentially revised timelines for the implementation of those new initiatives, which are unfunded mandates, which we discussed last with the legislators including the educator evaluation, common core standards, and secondary school reform. So anybody wants to go and talk to a number of legislators, and they vote them, at least 20 have signed up so far. And there are 35 towns in the Hartford District, so which CREC represents. So we're doing a pretty good representation at the moment. And I understand that Dr. Schumann is planning to attend as well. And anybody else who's willing to get up early in the morning, something I'm going to do again, um, is welcome to come. What's the date on that again, Joyce? February 7th, so Thursday, Thursday, 8 a.m. So I must have a previous commitment on that one. You've you got know. another meeting that day with the security? I know there's no, one no, this no, week. No, 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 it's, a, it's another hearing. Oh, the one that I said I couldn't attend. It must be, it must be. <laughs> Okay, Tom. Saturday night, February 2nd, I will be participating in the Enfield Trivia Night to support our first readers program. We have managed to put together two teams, um, and uh, we look forward to having more people show up, and uh, it's, it's supporting a very good program here in Enfield. That's uh, a kite program, so I'm uh, looking forward to seeing all of you there. And so will I. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Donna? Just a reminder that Saturday will be the interviews for the shortlisted architects for the Consolidated High School. It will be at Enfield High School in room B105, and it will also be reported, and it will be televised. So it should be interesting. Um, I just wanted to say a couple things. Um, I was going to actually speak about the Support Academy and that I was so thrilled that my son could participate in that. So again, thank you. I um, encourage parents to um, you know, look into it and it's a wonderful thing. Also, the um, program of studies are coming out for the 8th grade students um, here at the middle school for both Enfield High and Fermi. And the orientation, I do know Enfield High is next Monday with a snow day of next Wednesday, so um, eighth grade parents um, be ready for the program of studies from both Fermi and Enfield High. And that's it. Very good. 
Vinny? I have nothing. Good. Uh, I have a letter that was left here. It was addressed to Dr. Schumann. It's actually good news, financial news. I think uh, you folks will like that. It said, Dear uh, Superintendent Schumann, it closes the school district invoice for magnet school tuition for three and four year olds for the 2012 2013 school year. We recognize that the legislation requiring school districts to cover the tuition of these young children was untimely and unanticipated. It is clear to us that all school districts will struggle to find the funding required to cover these invoices. Further, we recognize that these budgetary decisions will come at a great cost to your district's education of students. Correct understands this hardship. We have decided that for the 2012 2013 school year, we will not exercise the option of asking you to pay these invoices, nor will we ask for a reduction in your ECS to cover the cost of these tuitions. In addition, we commit that any increase in magnet tuitions next year will not be used to cover this year's expenses. But this year only, we are prepared to absorb this expense to help you overcome this challenge. Please know that this will cause a hardship for CREC, just like the one your district faces. It continues to be our mission to serve the best interests of our member school districts, and for that reason, we have chosen to absorb this expense on behalf of your school district and the uh, uh, children and families you serve. Um, my understanding was previous to this that we uh, do a court ruling, I think, to several districts that gone to court on this one, that we weren't going to have to pay this because we don't offer this program currently. State then, Department. Uh, the State board. Department overturned State that. Board. State Board. No way. They, they changed it. And so that bill was going to come right now. It was certainly unanticipated. Let me just see. It was. Uh, How many? How many kids? I'm just trying to see here. The bill here is for $64,000. I think that's all ours. It's all the different magnet schools. I'll certainly pass this around to you folks to take a look at it. <coughs> um, but not having to pay that an unanticipated bill. But I think that means that next year we would have to. No, not necessarily. It depends on what the legislature does with the bill that's there that would make it the, not required. There's a, there's a new bill that's in there? In the, okay, very good. Thank you, Craig. Well, we don't know how to get this kind of good news. I just thought I'd uh, share it with you folks. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, uh, the presenters uh, today, uh, the uh, TAG folks, the, uh, uh, Mr. Gaffney and his crew. It was, it was enlightening. It was fun to, to watch them. Uh, and uh, Ms. McKiernan, uh, we, we appreciate it. And uh, we uh, uh, look forward to uh, uh, keep working on this stuff as we work our way to the budget. Thank you all very, very much. At this point, we have need to go into executive session for matters related to uh, security. Can I have a motion to that effect? So motion. Motion by uh, Tom Surratt, seconded by Vinnie Grady. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Then we're going to executive session. I believe we're going into the teaching lounge. Correct. Very good. Is there no No. <laughs> I didn't go in there, but yeah. You said it. I'll look at it. It's funny. I keep forgetting that for me. We are used to it. I sleep with him, so it could be painful. I used to go with him. How many years I did? Oh, you were talking about it. My husband's Enfield Little Lake. Thank you.